Semper Fi. Two words we can salute with the same merit as the Marines celebrated by this motto. Latin for always faithful. And perhaps the earliest love letter to this branch of service is JAG, which began its reign in the mid-90s and was here to stay for quite a long while. The success of this show comes from the great ideas from other franchises it borrowed from, or just took footage from, the incredibly cool toys it used, and the up-close and personal input it got from the Navy. All I'm doing is going blind. Well, that's why they stopped using it, sir. So it's sad to say this trailblazing titan that laid the groundwork for the third most popular crime drama on TV didn't get the graceful send-off it so very much deserved. Even the actors who told us these great stories were shocked. So what went wrong? And how did current events impact what the writers could film? I'm your host, Nostalgic Nick, here with all these secrets and more. When we're done, you'll go from probies to certified JAG experts. That's where we're heading. Is that right, Commander Miller? Yes, sir. So hop to and give this video a thumbs up if you don't mind. And subscribe to the channel so you can report in for our next deep dive. But without further ado, let's get to it. A match made in Navy Yard Heaven. So just what is JAG? It's an acronym that stands for Judge Advocate General, referring to uniformed lawyers that oversee pretty much everything legal for the US Navy, from rank designations, legal counsel, ethics, even environmental law. The 1990s saw us riding the high of great action shows with the graphics and tech to really sweep us off our feet. So why go the legal drama route? Well, there were two giants vying for viewers' attention at that time. The high-flying Top Gun and Handling the Truth, A Few Good Men. Both of these were very personal to TV producer Donald Belisario, who did serve in the Marine Corps. And he saw too many promotions and art that were anti-war and anti-soldier. Rambo, I don't make the orders. I take them just like you. Belisario made a point of dropping this trope, which we can see right off the bat in one of his first big creations, Magnum P.I. And he kept right on working with Universal with Quantum Leap. But then that door closed too. History in the making. It was during a slow work period that Belisario set to researching a new plot for a new show. The timing couldn't have been better. The year was 1994 and for the first time ever, 500 women were reporting for duty aboard combat ships as active part of combat units. It was a huge step from the clerical work they'd been restricted to just a few years prior, and many of them took to aviation. When Belisario learned about this, he saw a scene clear as day in his mind. Two F-14s, a female raider intercept officer, and an air group commander determined to, quote, put her through her paces. Stuff like this happens on two battlefields, one out in the field or sky, so to speak, and one at a desk, pushing all the papers to keep the military machine moving fairly for everyone. He's a member of the Judge Advocate General Corps. He's a lawyer. <laughs> so he approached NBC, pitching a new show combining Top Gun and A Few Good Men. A short life and grand reprieve. Once he got the green light, Belisario got to filming. NBC West Coast President Don Olmeyer exercised a lot of control over the plot and casting, obviously favoring action over legal drama. And this creative battle of wills went on for 22 episodes of filming. NBC only aired 21 and moved Jag from Saturdays to Wednesday. It struggled to stand out against Beverly Hills 90210 and the Jeff Foxworthy show. Sandra, help me! I can't find the remote! Where did you hide it? So, with pretty dismal reviews, NBC pulled the plug on JAG. That's it. The show was canceled. The end. Well, not quite, of course. Like a Navy aircraft carrier, CBS came chugging along to pick up JAG and keep it moving forward. Belisario got a lot more creative freedom with CBS, which took the show even in the middle of a season and aired it Friday nights. 
there was plenty of fodder for story ideas since Jag employed a ripped from the headlines approach early on. And this was just after the infamous tailhook scandal where dozens of men were accused of severe misconduct towards the women they worked with. Oh, I get it all too well, Master Chief. The world has changed and you got left behind. More stories to tell. When Belisario was learning about JAG, he found out about all the connected branches that basically make up the law there. At first, he just focused on prosecution and defense to keep things easy to follow. But by season eight, it was time to expand, but carefully. Enter NCIS for younger demographics, designed so no one could call it JAG 2.0. So, in 2003's episode, Ice Queen, he introduced Navy Criminal Investigate Service agents. You know, when we met the boss himself, Jethro Gibbs, very special agent Tony, Goth, Abby, and the most informative, Ducky, who all became mainstays on NCIS. This set up Ice Queen and Meltdown as backdoor pilots to new shows. Belisario didn't really want to keep his spinoffs related because he thought it might stifle NCIS's future. <laughs> Smart boys. Yeah. Start those engines. Let's get the hell out of here. Luckily, he didn't have anything to worry about because NCIS is 20 seasons in and it's inspiring more spinoffs of its own. NCIS Los Angeles, Hawaii, and New Orleans. And all this is thanks to Jag. NCIS is enjoying a spot as the third longest scripted primetime series only behind Law and & Order and Law and & Order SVU. Semper Fi. Now, Belisario was dedicated to authenticity and a positive portrayal of the military. When he watched anything war related, he observed, quote, anytime you saw a Vietnam vet in television, he was an alcoholic, a druggie, a shooter in a tower, a wife beater, a killer, or insane. And you never saw a positive image. So this shaped a lot of his choices for the show, especially realism. Producers and Navy officers had to learn each other's languages. And so they had retired Marine Corps Master Sergeant Matt Siglock on hand for the show's whole duration, serving as the official military technical advisor. And all this realism required the actors to do their homework too. The star, David James Elliott, had to read up on military etiquette to play harm. Sometimes the Navy put a hard no on plot points, like when a submarine accidentally dropped a nuke. But when the Navy liked what they saw or read, they allowed JAG to even use stock footage. JAG would take the help where it could, since the budget wasn't always so huge. So the show took footage from a very different source too, movies. Because they worked with Paramount, JAG got access to its library of movies. Yes, including Top Gun and Clear and Present Danger. Yeah, I guess when I see something, I go right after it. It takes a lot more than just fancy flying. Did those submarine shots look familiar? Then you must have seen Hunt for Red October or Crimson Tide. The right gear to fly high. Whenever we did see practical shots in JAG and not just Top Gun footage, we have prop master George Tours to thank for that. The guy had a laundry list of gear to secure. Among the cast of vehicles, the F-14 Tomcat was the star. But that thing was so big, they had to dismantle it and rebuild it. Sometimes they cut corners and the aircraft is actually an F-A Hornet or Super Hornet, which is the plane of choice for the Navy's Blue Angels. We get to see plenty of naval vessels too. The favorite to film on was the USS Forrestal CV-59. The names were changed, but JAG also used USS John F. Kennedy and USS Enterprise. No, not the starship. Real life impacts art. For all the creative freedom Belisario had during JAG's reprieve, some big things impacted what he could do. First, after 9-11, it became much harder to easily access all those restricted facilities, which is understandable, but was a huge hurdle for them to tackle. Then rewatch season eight, and you might notice the lieutenant herself is at a desk, holding stuff in front of her, generally hiding a lot. Well, that's because Belle was actually pregnant in real life. That's why we have Sarah pretending to be pregnant and then tossing away her padding, because when that happened, Belle had finally given birth. On the opposite end, art impacted life. As Belisario put it, quote, 
every Tuesday the show would run and every Wednesday the enlistment would spike. Why did JAG get cancelled? Belisario always wanted younger viewers hooked, but it always stayed more popular with older viewers. JAG held strong for 10 seasons, 227 episodes. That's a long time to run and the crew had very short notice it was ending at all. Both advertisers and producers love the 18 to 49 demographic, and JAG failed to capture this group and said goodbye to David James Elliott, in part to a back and forth contract dispute. Everything they do defies logic. Belisario and the writers got a grand total of a couple weeks to plan a finale of one of the best shows of the 1990s. And in turn, it was all kind of left as a cliffhanger, and not the send-off Jag deserved. But we can see plenty of the actors and characters in NCIS, I guess. And Belisario has left us plenty of other shows that became titans in their own right. But he admitted to fearing when Jag was gone, there would be a huge hole in media showing the military in a good light. It was a fresh take on the hardships of active duty, mixed with the interpersonal drama, politics, romance, and action. JAG really had it all. All right, enough of me, now I wanna hear from you. Do you watch any of its spin-off shows? Who was your favorite character on JAG? Which creation from Donald Belisario is your personal favorite? Get in the comments and I look forward to reading your thoughts. And if you enjoyed our flight, please give this video a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode like this. But from all of us here at Do You Remember, we want to thank you for watching.